Hello, my name is Kirk. I use they, them pronouns. And today I'm going to be reading some essays from Ursula K. Le Guin's The Wave in the Mind. Um, so first, who is Ursula K. Le Guin? Ursula, Ursula K. Le Guin is an incredible, incredible fiction author and nonfiction writer. Um, she's fantastic. Maybe you know her from uh, the Wizard of Earthsea series, which is a fantasy series, or um, some of her science fiction works. Left Hand of Darkness and The Dispossessed are really common. You know, she's this amazing, amazing woman, this amazing writer um, who puts who puts her like beliefs and philosophies into her work. And she's she's an anti-capitalist. Um, she's very much um, pro humanity, pro liberation, um, and it comes through in her works, which is amazing. Uh, the Wave in the Mind is a book she wrote about writing, reading about making things. It's really, it's really fantastic. She says, talks and essays on the writer, the reader, and the imagination. So that should give you an idea into what Wave in the Mind is about. I've read this book cover to cover, I don't know, maybe like three or four times already. It's like, I, I read it once a year. It's, it gives you such a good grounding for people who want to write, for people who want to do creative work. Highly, highly recommend it because it, it, it's like, it gives you ways of looking at things, but it also gives you ways of thinking of things in concrete I guess, tactics for approaching creative work. Um, all right, so let's get started on the first essay I'm gonna read is called uh, Being Taken for Granted. Sometimes I'm taken for granted. Everybody is taken for granted sometimes, but I'm not in a mood for being fair to everybody. I'm in a mood for being fair to me. I'm taken for granted quite often and this troubles and distresses me because I am not granite. I'm not sure what I am, but I know it isn't granite. I've known some granite types, we all do, characters of stone, upright, immovable, unchangeable, opinions the general size and shape and pliability of the Rocky Mountains. You have to query five years to chip out one little stony smile. That's fine, that's admirable, but has nothing to do with me. Upright is fine, but downright is where I am, or down wrong. I am not granite and I should not be taken for it. I'm not flint or diamond or any of that great hard stuff. If I am stone, I am some kind of shoddy, crumbly stuff like sandstone or serpentine and maybe schist. Or not even stone, but clay. Or not even clay, but mud. And I wish that those who take me for granted would once in a while treat me like mud. Being mud is really different from being granite and should be treated differently. Mud lies and heavy and oozy and generative. Mud is underfoot. People make footprints in mud. As mud, I accept feet. I accept weight. I try to be supportive. I like to be obliging. Those who take me for granted say this is not so, but they haven't been looking where they put their feet. That's why the house is all dirty and tracked up. Granite does not accept footprints. It refuses them. Granite makes pinnacles, and then people rope themselves together and put pins on their shoes and climb the pinnacles at great trouble, expense, and risk. And maybe they experience a great thrill. The granite does not. Nothing whatever results and nothing whatever is changed. Huge, heavy things come and stand on granite. And the granite just stays there and doesn't react and doesn't give way and doesn't adapt and doesn't oblige. Walk away. The granite is there just the same as it was before. Just exactly the same, admirably. To change granite, you have to blow it up. But when people walk on me, you can see exactly where they put their feet. And when huge, heavy things come and stand on me, I yield and react and respond and give way and adapt and accept. No explosives are called for. No admiration is called for. I have my own nature and am true to it just as much as granite or even diamond is. But it is not a hard nature or upstanding or gem-like. You can't chip it. It's deeply impressionable. It's squashy. Maybe the people who rope themselves together and the huge heavy things resent such adaptable and uncertain footing because it makes them feel insecure. Maybe they fear they might be sucked in and swallowed, but I'm not interested in sucking and I am not hungry. I am just mud. I yield, I do try to oblige. And so when the people and the huge heavy things walk away, they are not changed except their feet are muddy, but I am changed. I am still here and still mud, 
but all full of footprints and deep, deep holes and tracks and traces and changes. I've been changed. You change me. Do not take me for granted. So that, that's that. That's the first one, do, being taken for granted. It's a really beautiful um, sentiment. It's the, the idea behind the I am mud thing behind me, if you can see that. Um, yeah, just like talking about uh, being, soft, being soft in a hard world, right? Um, she talks about this in a few other places as well, but this is like, this is her like, per, this is from a, a section called personal matters in the book. So this is her like personal exploration of, of this idea. And I just love that she finds humor in it, obviously like saying, calling herself squashy, um, I think is, is definitely intended to be humorous. Um, this whole, this whole thing is, is funny and, and sweet and insightful, um, yeah, it's and it's pretty straightforward. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next short essay that she wrote. Um, yeah, it's called My Libraries. This was a talk given in 1997 at a celebration of the renovation of Portland's Multnomah County Library. A library is a focal point, a sacred place to a community, and its sacredness is its accessibility, its publicness. It's everybody's place. I remember certain libraries vividly and joyfully as my libraries, elements of the best of my life. The first one I knew well was in St. Helena, California, then a small, peacefully, mostly Italian town. The library was a little Carnegie, white stucco, cool and sleepy on the fiery August afternoons when my mother would leave my brother and me there while she shopped at Junie's and Tassetti's. Carl and I went through the children's room like word-seeking missiles. After we had read everything, including all 13 volumes of the adventures of a fat boy detective, we had to be allowed to go into the adult side. That was hard for the librarians. They felt they were hurling us little kids into a room full of sex, death, and weird grown-ups like Heathcliff and the Jodes. And in fact, they were. We were intensely grateful. The only trouble with the St. Helena Library was you could only take five books out at a time, and we only went into town once a week. So we checked out really solid books. I mean, 500 pages of small print and new columns, like The Count of Monte Cristo. Short books were no good. Two days orgy and then starve the rest of the week. Nothing but the farmhouse bookcase. We could recite everything in it by the time we were 10. I imagine we were the only people in the Napa Valley who regularly hit each other on the head with quarter staves while shouting, Varlet, have at thee. Why, fat knave, thinkest thou to cross this bridge? Carl usually got to be Robin Hood because he was older, but at least I never had to be made Marion. Next in my life was the branch of the Berkeley Library near Garfield Junior High, where my dearest memories of my friend Shirley leading me to the end shelf and saying, there's this writer called E. Nesbitt, and you have to read the one called Five Children and Eight. And boy, was she right. By eighth grade, I sort of oozed over into the adult room. The librarians pretended not to notice, but when I arrived at the adult checkout carrying a thick, obscure biography of Lord Dunsany, like a holy relic, I remember the librarian's expression. It was very much like the expression of the US Customs Inspector in Seattle, years later when he opened my suitcase and found a Stilton cheese. Not a decent whole cheese, but a ruin, a moldy rind, a smelly remnant which our friend Barbara in Berkshire had affectionately but unwisely sent to my husband. The customs man said, what is it? Well, it's an English cheese, I said. He was a tall black man with a deep voice. He shut the suitcase and said, lady, if you want it, you can have it. And the librarian let me have Lord Dunsany too. After that came the Berkeley Public Library itself, which is blessedly placed just a block or two from Berkeley Public High School. I loved the one as deeply as I hated the other. In one, I was in exile in the Siberia of adolescent social mores. In the other, I was home free. Without the library, I wouldn't have survived the school, not in my right mind anyhow. But then adolescents are all crazy. I discovered that the foreign books were up on the third floor and nobody ever went there, so I moved in. I lived there crouched in a spider webby window with Cyrano de Bergerac in French. I didn't know enough French yet to read Cyrano, but that didn't stop me. That's when I learned you can read a language you don't know if you love it enough. 
You can do anything if you love it enough. I cried a lot up there over Cyrano and other people. I discovered Jean Christophe and cried over him and Baudelaire and cried over him. Only a 15 year old can truly appreciate the flowers of evil, I think. Sometimes I raided the lower English speaking regions of the library and brought back writers such as Ernest Dowson. I have been faithful to the Cyrano in my fashion and cried some more. Uh, those were good years for crying and a library is a good place to cry in, quietly. Next in my life was Radcliffe's small endearing college library. And then when they decided I could be permitted to enter it, even though I was a freshman and what's far worse, a fresh woman, Widner, Col Widner Library at Harvard. I will tell you my private definition of freedom. Freedom is stack privileges at Widner Library. I remember the first time I came outside from those endless incredible stacks, I could barely walk because I was carrying about 25 books, but I was flying. I turned around and looked up the broad steps of the building and I thought, that's heaven. That's the heaven for me. All the words in the world and all for me to read, free at last, Lord, free at last. I hope you'll understand that I am not quoting those great words lightly. I do mean it. Knowledge sets us free. Art sets us free. A great library is freedom. So then after a mad but brief Parisian affair with the Bibliothèque Nationale, I arrived in Portland. Our first years here, we had two little babies and I was at home with them. The great treat for me, the holiday I wanted, the event I looked forward to all week or month was to get a sitter and come downtown with Charles and go to the library. At night, of course, there's no way to do it in the daytime, a couple of hours till the library closed at nine plunging into the ocean of words, roaming in the broad fields of the mind, climbing the mountains of the imagination, just like the kid in the Carnegie or the student in Widmer. That was my freedom. That was my joy, and it still is. That joy must not be sold. It must not be privatized, made into another privilege for the privileged. A public library is a public trust, and that freedom must not be compromised. It must be available to all who need it, and that's everyone when they need it. And that's always. Oh, I, I get so emotional in that last line. Oh, it's so, it's so beautiful and so true. It's, um, it's just incredible to, to look at libraries through her lens and to see it this way. I don't think we have the same sort of thing with libraries anymore. Like people growing up now don't, don't need to form those kinds of relationships because there's a lot of, of reading and stuff that can be done um, virtually, remotely. Um, but it's, but having this idea of like a repository of knowledge um, accessible to everyone, made, made intentionally to be accessible and free to everyone is so critical. And that's something that I think that um, it's so important to keep in mind um, for, for the world that we're trying to make together, the world that we're always, always making together as we go along um, is that information and that literature and that art needs to be accessible to everyone and needs to be given freely to everyone. Um, so I just think that that's a really, it's a really nice um, essay on her personal experiences with, um, with libraries that she's that she's had throughout her life. Let's see what other ones do I want to read. Um, I guess I'll just go ahead and continue on and read this one called My Island. Invited to write about a favorite island, at first I couldn't think of a real one, only the unattained or the imaginary. Islands are by definition separated from the ordinary world not part of it, isolate. So I thought first of the Farallons, those rock, foggy rocks sometimes visible from San Francisco's cliff house, dimly seen way out in the gray sea. When I was a child, they were my image of the loneliest place, the farthest west you could go, and they have such a beautiful name. Los Farallones means cliffs, crags, a lovely word, and in English it gathers echoes, far away and all alone. But that's all I know about the Farallons, where I will never go. So then I thought about islands I'd found in my own mind, the ones I called Earthsea, a whole archipelago occupied by wizards, housewives, dragons, and other fascinating people. 
I know those islands well. I've written books about them. I gave them fine names, Gaunt and Roke and Havnor, Selador and Oskil and the Hands. I never expected to see Earth in the real world, but I did once. I was on a ship that sailed right around the British Isles up to the Orkneys and the Hebrides, out to Lewis and Harris to Skye and down the Western coast past Scotland and past Wales. And there they were, my islands, scattered before us in a golden sea, fantastic, unearthly, surely full of dragons, the Skillies. Another lovely name. Why are you giggling? Because I saw the Skilly Isles. But a real island, not a dream or a name or a glimpse. I couldn't think of one I could write about until I remembered that not all islands are in the sea. Big ocean going freighters sail past it every day. Sometimes cruise ships, often sailboats, but my island is some 80 miles inland. A faint lift and ebb of the tides is still in the water that flows past it, but it's not salt water. Savi Island lies just downstream from where Portland's river, the Willamette, enters the immense Columbia. Savi is one of the biggest river islands in the country, 15 miles long and three or four wide. Along the gray branches of its outer side runs the broad, powerful current of the Columbia. On the inner side, a slow flowing slough lets fishermen's boats drift along between the marshes, the clusters of houseboats, the landing stages of old farms. Canals intersect the island, irrigating the farms. Shallow lakes deepen and dry up with the seasons. In the old days before the dikes were built, before the upriver Columbia was dammed and dammed again, Savi Island flooded every year. It was all dairy farms then. The farmers rounded up the cattle when the water rose and drove them onto the few bits of high ground, still called islands within the island. There they waited out the flood, some of them moving, mooing and some of them chewing tobacco, I imagine. Then they came back down to the rich, silty pastures. They sent their milk and butter by boat to Portland, just upstream. There was no bridge from the mainland to Savi Island until 1950. There used to be an old man who rode his boat around the whole island from farm to farm. Every farm had a boat ramp, selling trinkets and buttons and thread and candy, a kind of one man, two oared dime store for the islanders. Hearing about those old days, you get the feeling it wasn't the islanders who wanted the bridge. They were quite content. It was the mainlanders who longed to get across the water, but wrapped by the huge trucks we use now, the bridge is threatening to break down and the farmers of the island are getting a bit desperate, worrying they won't be able to get their produce to the Portland markets. Long before the pioneers, Saudi was a home and a trading center for the peoples of the river, those marvelous canoe makers for whom the Columbia was not a barrier, but a highway. Lewis and Clark called it Wapato Island for the food staple that still grows there, an underwater root with tall lance-shaped leaves. But epidemics brought by early white explorers devastated the Columbia River peoples, and a fur trader wrote of the island people in 1835 that there is nothing to attest that they ever existed except their graves. When the Oregon Trail led homesteaders to the island, they found it desolate, and it still keeps a deep quietness which sometimes becomes uncanny. These days, the downstream half of the island is a wildlife preserve, a dreamy silence of marshy woods, huge old oaks, vast flocks of ducks, geese, and trumpeter swans feeding and flying until hunting season, when it gets noisy for a while. The upstream half is still farmed. I know no place in America that looks so gardened, the way old farmlands in England look, the care and thought with which it's planted and tended and cherished make it beautiful. But behind the thriving nurseries, berry farms and pumpkin patches rise the great blues above the Columbia, still forested, still half wild. Turn around into the Northeast see snow crowned mountains, Hood, Adams, St. Helens, looming low since her eruption and farther north, Rainier. Then all at once, like a mirage, a huge Japanese freighter carrying cars floats quietly by between the pumpkins and the mountains. Savi is only half an hour's drive from downtown Portland a city of three quarters of a million people. The highway to it passes the busy port of Portland and an industrial district of warehouses, storage tanks, railway sidings, factories. Then suddenly there's a turn to the little two lane bridge and you're deep in the country. Though it is so close, so easy to get to 
And so many Portlanders love to go over to Savi's to pick strawberries, raspberries, marionberries, blueberries in the summer, buy squash and onions in the autumn, play on the beaches, swim in the river, fish in the slob, hunt or hike the woodland trails or bird watch and picnic under the oaks. Even so, it remains rural and peaceful as if it were a piece of the past, timeless between its rivers. How long can it keep that quietness? So far, it has defended itself against such fatal intrusions as a huge garbage dump and a Japanese-owned golf course for millionaires. So far, no ticky-tacky developments, no McMansions have been allowed on the farmlands or the fish and game preserve. But land use laws are so easily tossed aside. Silence is so easily broken. How long can an island in an ever-deepening sea of humanity remain far away and all alone? So that's a nice little piece on contemplating, contemplating basically colonization in a sense. And um, I would say that if Ursula K. Le Guin has one pretty serious flaw, it's that she tends to um, write about indigenous people as if they are all gone, as if they no longer exist. Um, Disappearing, the disappearing Indian is like a phrase that I've 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 heard used in a way that a lot of people talk about indigenous people in the United States is talking about them as if they no longer exist, but they do. They do exist. They there's a lot of indigenous people who exist today, still living, still you know, engaging with the world like all human beings are. Um, so I would say that that's kind of a flaw of her writing. You'll see it in some of her other things. I specifically am trying not to read like some of the some of the ones that I think are a little more egregious in that aspect. Um, but for the most part, she's like generally pretty good about that stuff. Um, but yeah, that's sort of just like a little snippet. Um, I just want to say like if anyone has any thoughts about these essays that I'm reading, please feel free to jump in. I do. I don't want to like just. I don't want it to be like a lecture necessarily. Like you can definitely talk about this and bring up things that you're interested in and things that stuck out to you. Um, and maybe we'll have some time at the end to just like talk about the whole, every everything we've read, just like Ursula's ideas in general, so to speak. Um, but yeah, these are not necessarily like huge, huge pieces either in the, in the sense where we couldn't, we don't need to like have an hour long conversation talking about them. But if there are any thoughts that you have, um, yeah, Vico says, I really like the way she, uh, she writes about place and how rooted all her writing is in setting. Totally, I, I'm a huge fan of that as well. Um, she does, I think her writing is so elegant and she paints such an incredible picture. Um, and just like, she like sucks you in, sucks you into her world. Um, I feel like in some of her books, the setting is a character. So it's interesting to see her write about real places. Totally. Um, she actually in her, in another of her nonfiction books, she has a, um, an essay about a trip she took to England, which I think uh, you would really like. Um, and she like talks about going to these different places, these like really like this like ancient carving in a hillside um, that she finds that just like, what's what's great is like, she doesn't lose her perspective. So it's like, she talks about like how she comes into places, like what she sees when she first arrives and like the spectacle of seeing something incredible and grand. And then like talks about like the place itself and what the people are like there. Um, she has a really strong uh, sense of place um, for sure. And that's one of my favorite things about her writing. Um, all right, well, um, hold, on, hold on to your hats folks, uh, because I'm about to read uh, an essay of hers called On the Frontier. I know I just said I was trying to stay away from like kind of the erasure of indigenous people, um, but and not, but uh, I'm sorry, like this is a good one. I prom I am promising you and that's why I'm gonna read it. I'm not trying to regurgitate um, bad thought, if that makes sense. Okay, so this essay is called On the Frontier. Um, it was written in 1996 for the journal Frontiers, which it appeared, where it appeared as, which side am I on anyway? 
It has been rewritten for this book. Okay. The frontier. A frontier has two sides. It is an interface, a threshold, a liminal site with all the danger and promise of liminality. The front side, the yang side, the side that calls itself the frontier, that's where you boldly go where no one has gone before. Rushing forward like a storm front, like a battle front, nothing before you is real. It is empty space. My favorite quotation from the great frontiersman Julius Caesar, it was not certain that Britannia existed until I went there. It does not exist. It is empty and therefore full of dream and promise, the seven shining cities. And so you go there, seeking gold, seeking land, annexing all before you, you expand your world. The other side of the frontier, the yin side, that's where you live. You always live there. It's all around you, it's always been. It is the real world, the true and certain world full of reality. And it is where they come. You were not certain that they existed until they came. Coming from another world, they take yours from you, changing it, draining it, shrinking it into a property, a commodity. And as your world is meaningless to them until they change it into theirs, so as you live among them and adopt their meanings, you are in danger of losing your own meaning to yourself. In the wake of the North American frontiers where my father, the anthropologist, did his field work, among the wrecks of cultures, the ruins of languages, the broken or almost broken continuities and communities, the shards of an infinite diversity smashed by a monoculture. A post-frontiersman, a white immigrant son learning Indian cultures and languages in the first half of the 20th century, he tried to save meaning, to learn and tell the stories that might otherwise be lost. The only means he had to do so was by translating recording in his foreign language, the language of science, the language of the conqueror, an act of imperialism, an act of human solidarity. My mother continued his work with her history of a survivor of the frontier, the native Californian, Ishii. I admire her book as deeply as I admire its subject, but have always regretted the subtitle, a biography of the last wild Indian in North America, for it contradicts the sense and the spirit of the story she tells. Ishii was not wild. He did not come out of the wilderness, but out of a culture and tradition far more deeply rooted and soundly established than that of the frontiersman who slaughtered his people to get their land. He did not live in a wilderness, but in a dearly familiar world, he and his people knew hill by hill, river by river, stone by stone. Who made those golden hills a wilderness of blood and mourning and ignorance? If there are frontiers between the civilized and the barbaric, between the meaningful and the unmeaning, they are not lines on a map, nor are they regions on the earth. They are boundaries of the mind alone. My frontiers. Innate or acquired, a delight in learning unfamiliar, foreign, alien, wild, significances, and an unwillingness to limit value or significance to a single side of the frontier have shaped my writing. North Americans have looked at their future as they looked at their Western lands, as an empty place. Animals, Indians, aliens don't count. Uh, to be conquered, to be tamed, filled up with themselves and their doings, a meaningless blank onto which to write their names. This is the same future one finds in much science fiction, but not in mine. In mine, the future is already full. It is much older and larger than our present, and we are the aliens in it. My fantasies explore the use of power as art and its misuse as domination. They play back and forth what we think is real and what we think is imaginary, exploring the borderlands. Capitalism, which ceases to exist if it is not expanding its empire, establishes an ever-moving frontier, and its yang conquistu El Dorado. Rich, they cry. My realistic fictions are mostly about people on the yang capitalism, housewives, waitresses, librarians, Keeper of dis keepers of dismal little motels, the people who live, you might say, on the res, in the broken world the conquistadors will leave behind. Living in a world that is valued only as gain, as expanding world, as frontier that has no worth of its own, no fullness of its own, you live in danger of losing your own worth to yourself. That's when you begin to listen to the voices from the other side and to, qu and to ask questions of failure in the dark. I am a granddaughter of the American frontier, my mother's family moved and bought and farmed and failed and moved on from Missouri to Wyoming, to Colorado, to Oregon, to California and back. We followed Yang, we found Yin. I am grateful. 
My heritage is the wild oats the Spanish sowed on the hills of California. The cheek grass the ranchers left on the counties of Harney and Muller. Those are the crops my people planted and I have reaped. There is my straw spun gold. Yeah. So yeah, this she even brings up the sort of idea that I was talking about earlier, the um, the appearing Indian. Um, uh, she talks about Western people looking at lands as an empty place where animals, Indians, and aliens don't count. Um, they're not even there in the first place. They're uh, and when they are there, they're they're savages, right? Um, and like ta talking about it is, I think, a really crucial understanding to know to to look at the perspective of the frontier um, in this way, like that we get taught in school only about one side of the frontier, only about the expanding side of the frontier. And as as with, I mean, in our in our history books, like the, the native people are disappeared, the indigenous people are disappeared, their their lives, their deaths, their their whole existence and culture is is a footnote. And we only really talk about that we killed them, that white people, that white settlers killed these indigenous people and took, took everything from them and over and over again betrayed them and took everything from them so many fucking times across hundreds of years. Um, that's, the, that's the only part we learn about. And it's so sad and shallow to look at our world that way because there was a full human society like many hundreds of societies, many hundreds, many thousands of communities that lived here where we now stand. I'm in New York. I grew up in California. The entire continental United States, the entire United States period was stolen from indigenous people who lived here before who had that life where things had always been the way that they had been, that they had lived in these continuous societies that were interrupted by the invasion of white Western imperialists. Um, so I think it's good. I think I really, what I really love and appreciate about Ursula K. Le Guin is her, her gentleness, her, her gentleness to uncover the nuance of situations like that. And it's like, obviously there is like a right and wrong there. I'm not trying to say like who, like, both sides, like what I'm trying to say is that when we only focus on things like the, when we focus on imperialism is bad and indigenous people, they were robbed and killed and bad thing. When we just, when, when that, that sort of ends a conversation. And I'm not trying to say that we have to like indulge whether the imperialists were good or not, but I think we have to like say like, what is more, what is beyond that? Why is it bad? How, how, how do we discuss how do we make amends for that violence? Um, and I think part of it is at least sort of remembering, remembering that um, that violence was not the beginning and the end of the indigenous people who lived on Turtle Island. That was an incident that happened that was wrought on them by Western people, by white people, but they had a long history. They have a huge, huge, huge culture that existed thousands of years before that happened. Um, and, and making it, making even, even as anti-imperialists make, uh, um, talking about colonization as if it's the beginning of a history is, is er erasing the indigenous cultures that did exist here for thousands of years before a single white person set foot on this island. Um, so I do appreciate Ursula K. Le Guin for, for being so thoughtful about, um, about colonization and the frontier and interrogating these, these often sort of overlooked um, aspects of, of our world, of our, of our society. Um, da -da. All right. I recall that this is a good one. I have a dog-eared. Um, it's called Award and Gender. 
you may know, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin is a notorious uh, awards talk um, subverter of intentions. There was the famous time when she was being presented a lifetime achievement award for writing from Amazon. And she that is where her famous quote comes from. Um, Capitalism was made by human hands. Uh, it can be unmade. Uh, what is it? Uh, we we believe that capitalism is un unshakable. They thought the same thing about the divine right to rule. Uh, anything made by human hands can be unmade by human hands. And she said that she said that to a room full of Amazon execs. Um, so we can all be a little bit braver in our anti-capitalism, I think. But so this one. Um, Yes, this is a good. This is a good essay. It's called "Award and Gender." This was given as a talk and a handout at the Seattle Book Fair in 1999. Um, so there you have it. In 1998, I was on a jury of three choosing a literary prize. From 104 novels, we selected a winner and four books for the shortlist, arriving at consensus with unusual ease and unanimity. We were three women and the books we chose were all written by women. The eldest and wisest of us uh, said, ouch, if a jury of, a, of women picks only women finalists, people will call us a feminist cabal and dismiss our choices as prejudice and the winning book will suffer for it. I said, but if we were men and picked all books by men, nobody would say a damn thing about it. True, said our wise woman, but we want our winner to have credibility, and the only way three women can have credibility as a jury is to have some men on the shortlist. Against my heart and will, I agreed. And so two women who should have been there got bumped from our shortlist, and the two men whose books we had placed sixth and seventh got on it. Literary awards used to be essentially literary events. Though a prize such as the Pulitzer certainly influenced the sale of a book, that wasn't all it was valued for. Since the takeover of most publishing houses by their accounting departments, the financial aspect of the literary award has become more and more important. These days, literary prizes carry a huge weight in fame, money, and shelf longevity, but only some of them. Certain awards are newsworthy and success assuring, most of them are not. The selection of which prize is sure to hit the headlines and which is ignored seems to be almost totally arbitrary. The media follow habit without question. Hysteria about the Booker Prize is assured. Uh, general indifference to the PEN Western States Award is certain. Most writers who have served on award juries agree that the field of finalists is all, often so qualitatively even that the selection of a single winner is essentially arbitrary. Many also agree that in the field of finalists often contains books so various in nature and intent that the selection of a single winner, again, is essentially arbitrary. But a single winner is what is demanded of them, so they provide it. Then publishers capitalize on it, bookstores fawn on it, libraries stock their shelves with it, while the shortlist books are forgotten. I feel that the competitive single winner pattern is suited to sports events, but not to literature that the increasingly exaggerated dominance of the big awards in the field of fiction is pernicious, and that the system inevitably perpetuates cronyism, geographical favoritism, gender favoritism, and big name syndrome. Of these, gender favoritism particularly irks me. It is so often and so indignantly denied that I begin to wonder if I was irked over nothing. I decided to try and find if my impression that the great majority of literary awards went to men had any foundation in fact. To establish my facts, I limited my study to fiction. If more men than women publish fiction, that would of course justify an imbalance towards male prize winners. So to start, I did some gender sampling of authors and novels and story collections published in various periods from 1996 to 1998. My time was limited and my method was crude. The numbers, only about a thousand writers in all, may not be large enough to be statistically significant. My author gender count covers only four recent years, while my figures on the awards go back decades. A study on author gender fiction in the whole 20th century would be a very interesting subject for thesis. My, my sources were Publishers Weekly for general fiction, What Do I Read Next for genre fiction, and The Horn Book for children's books. I counted authors by sex, omitting collaborations, and any names that were not gender identifiable. My genre sources identified aliases. Uh, rumor has it that many romances are written by men under female pen names. I found only one transgender, -er. that's, 
sick as she wrote it. Transgenderer, a woman mystery writer who used a male name. Um, author gender, summations. Um, general fiction, 192 men, 167 women, slightly more men than women. Genre fiction, 208 men, 250 women, more women than men. Children's books and young adult, 83 men, 161 women, twice as many women as men. All genres, 483 men, 578 women, about five women to four men. You did not expect statistics in this stream, I bet, um, but you get it. Um, <laughs> 80 of these in my genre category were romance writers, all women. You consider them as probably balanced by predominantly male written genres such as sports, war, and porn, which I did not have figures for, you might arrive at parody. It looks as if overall as many women as men, perhaps slightly more women than men, write and publish novels and stories. Author gender in fiction is pretty near one to one. Now for the gender counts and ratios for literary prizes. Ideally, I would have I listed the short list of the runners up were available, but given the shortness of time in which I had to prepare this paper and the shortness of life, I list only winners. Information on most awards, including shortlist winners and sometimes jurors, is accessible at libraries and on the net. The years covered are the years the prize has been given up to 1998. These spans, of course, vary greatly. The oldest is the Nobel Prize in Literature. I did not try to find out the gender composition of the juries of any of these awards, though many are on record. I wish I had the time to go into this and find out whether juries are gender balanced or not, whether the balance has changed over time, and whether gender composition influences their choices. One might well assume that men tend to pick men and women women, but if juries are even moderately balanced between men and women, my figures do not support this assumption. It looks as if men and women tend to pick men. Most awards are chosen by a judge or panel of judges, but some genre prizes are voted by readers, or in the case of the Nebula Award, fellow writers in the genre. In this context, I want to point out that the MacArthur Genius Awards are nominated by experts chosen by the MacArthur Foundation, and the winners are selected by a board chosen by the foundation, a permanently secret board whose members are therefore, in the true meaning of the word, irresponsible. In the, all the arts awards given by the MacArthur Foundation, I find the three to one gender ratio three men to one women, so consistent, I must assume it is the result of de deliberate policy. So here are the gender ratio of literary prizes, male to female, in order of the most extreme parity to the nearest parity. So the ones that are furthest from equal to the closest to equal. Nobel Prize in Literature, 10 men for every one woman. PEN slash Faulkner Award for Fiction, eight to one. Edgar Grand Master Award, seven to one. National Book Award, now American Book Award, six to one. World Fantasy Lifetime Achievement Award, six to one. Pulitzer Prize for Literature since 1943, five to one. Edgar Award for Best Novel, five to one. Hugo Award, three to one. World Fantasy Best Novel, three to one. Newbery Award, three to one. Nebula Award, uh, 2.4 to one. Pulitzer Prize for Literature, two to one. Edgar Award for Best Novel, two to one. Booker Prize, two to one. Some observations. Though the number of men and women writing literary fiction is nearly equal, the big literary awards, Nobel, National Book Award, Booker, Penn, Pulitzer, give 5.5 prizes to men for every one to a woman. Genre awards average four to one, so a woman stands a better chance of getting a prize if she writes genre fiction. Among all the prizes I counted, the ratio is 4.5 to one. For every woman who gets a fiction prize, four and a half men do or to avoid the uncomfortable idea of half men, you can say that nine men get a prize for every two women that do. Except in Nobel, which gave three women prizes in the 90s, there was no gain in gender parity in these prizes during the 20th century, and in some cases, a drastic decline. I broke the figures down for the Pulitzer into before and after 1943, and the Edgar Best novel into before and after 1970 to demonstrate the most notable examples of this decline. There would have, there would have to be a, have been a massive change in author gender, a great increase in the number of men writing fiction in these fields to explain or justify the increasing percentage of, a ma of male award winners. I do not have the figures, but my impression is that there has not been any such great increase. My guess is that the 50-50 ratio of men and women writing fiction has been fairly constant throughout the 8th century. In children's literature, whereby my rough count, there are twice as many women authors, men win three times as many prizes as women. Nearly two thirds of mystery writers are women, but men get three times as many prizes as women. And since 1970, five times as many. The inescapable conclusion is that prize juries, whether they consist of readers, writers, or pundits through conscious or unconscious prejudice, reward men four and a half times more than women. 
The escapable conclusion is that men write fiction four and a half times better than women. This conclusion appears to be acceptable to many people, so long as it goes unspoken. Those of us who do not find it acceptable have to speak. Literary juries and the sponsors of awards need to have their prejudices queried and their consciousness raised. The perpetuation of gender prejudice through literary prizes should be challenged by fair-minded writers, by discussions such as this, by further and better research, and by letters of comment and protest to the awarding bodies, to literary publications and the press. Um, she has a multi-page appendix that goes into all of the, the stats that I read earlier. So it's like, if you wanted more stats, I'm not gonna read them, you can, that doesn't seem um, meaty enough content for this video. Uh, but yeah, so interesting. It's very, I love that she was so pissed off about this situation where she had to give shortlist prizes to men, even though they didn't deserve it, that she went and did a bunch of research on the history of awards and like the, the gender parody of, of writing fiction it's like and it's just like no shit it's like and here's the proof it's like men get 4.5 times as many awards as women fucking ridiculous and that this wasn't that long ago and i bet it hasn't really changed much um it'll be interesting to see also like a racial breakdown of these awards as well because i bet white people get most of the awards still um but it's just interesting she's so fucking funny i love i love her writing um, what did she say? Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, the escapable conclusion is that men write fiction four and a half times better than women. This conclusion appears to be acceptable to so many people as long as it goes unspoken. Um, that's hilarious. That is really, really funny. Um, because obviously men do not write uh, fiction four and a half times better than women. Um, that is the escapable conclusion. Um, God, she's, she's really funny. Um, Okay, here's, a, here's another, here's, a, here's like a, a lighthearted one. It's called Dogs, Cats, and Dancers, Thoughts About Beauty. An earlier version of this piece was published in 1992 in the reflection section of Allure magazine, where it was retitled The Stranger Within. Uh, I have fiddled around with it a good bit since then. Dogs don't know what they look like. Dogs don't even know what size they are. No doubt it's our fault for breeding them into such weird shapes and sizes. My brother's uh, dachshund standing tall at eight inches would attack a Great Dane in the full conviction that she could tear it apart. When a little dog is assaulting its ankles, the big dog often stands there looking confused. Should I eat it? Will it eat me? I am bigger than it, aren't I? But then the Great Dane will come and try to sit in your lap and mash you flat under the impression that it's a poo. My children used to run at the sight of a nice deer hound named Teddy because Teddy was so glad to see him that he wagged his whiplash tail so hard that he knocked them over. Dogs don't notice when they put their paws in the quiche. Dogs don't know where they begin and end. Cats know exactly where they begin and end. When they walk slowly out the door that you are holding open for them and pause, leaving their tail just an inch or two inside the door, they know it. They know you have to keep holding the door open. That is why their tail is there. It is a cat's way of maintaining a relationship. House cats know they are small and that it matters. When a cat meets a threatening dog and can't make either a horizontal or vertical escape, it'll suddenly triple its size, inflating itself into a sort of weird fur blowfish. And it may work because the dog gets confused again. I thought that was a cat. Aren't I bigger than cats? Will it eat me? Once I met a huge black balloon-like object levitating across the sidewalk, making a horrible moaning growl. It pursued me across the street. I was afraid it might eat me. When we got to our front steps, it began to shrink and leaned on my leg and I recognized my cat, Leonard. He'd been alarmed by something across the street. Cats have a sense of appearance. Even when they're sitting doing the wash in that silly position with one leg behind the other ear, they know what you're sniggering at. They simply choose not to notice. I knew a pair of Persian cats once. The black one always reclined on a white cushion on the couch and the white one on the black cushion next to it. It wasn't just that they wanted to leave cat hair where it showed up best, though cats are always thoughtful about that. They knew it looked best. 
the lady who provided their pillows called them her decorator cats. A lot of us humans are like dogs. We really don't know what size we are, how we're shaped, what we look like. The most extreme example of this ignorance must be the people who design the seats on airplanes. At the other extreme, the people who have the most accurate vision of dancers. What dancers look like after all, what dancers look like is after all what they do. I suppose this is also true of fashion models, but in such a limited way. In modeling, what you look like to a camera is all that matters. It's very different from really living in your body um, the way a dancer does. Actors must have a keen self-awareness and learn to know what their body and face are doing and expressing, but actors use words in their art, and words are great illusion makers. A dancer can't weave that word screen around herself. All a dancer has to make her art from is her appearance, position, and motion. The dancers I've known have no illusions or confusions about what space they occupy. They hurt themselves a lot. Dancing is murder on feet and pretty tough on joints, but they never ever step in the quiche. At a rehearsal, I saw a young man of the troupe lean over like a tall willow to examine his ankle. Oh, he said, I have an owie on my almost perfect body. It was endearingly funny, but it was also simply true. His body is almost perfect. He knows it and knows where it isn't. He keeps it nearly as perfect as he can because his body is his instrument, his medium, how he makes a living and what he makes art with. He inhabits his body as fully as a child does, but much more knowingly, and he's happy about it. I like that about dancers. There's so much happy dieters and exercisers. Guys go jogging up my street, thump, 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 grim faces, glazed eyes, seeing nothing, ears plugged by earphones. If there was a quiche on the sidewalk, their weird gaudy running shoes would squish right through it. Women talk endlessly about how many pounds last week, how many pounds to go. If they saw a quiche, they'd scream. If your body isn't perfect, punish it. No pain, no gain, all that stuff. Perfection is lean and taut and hard, like a boy athlete of 20, a girl gymnast of 12. What kind of body is that for a man of 50 or a woman of any age? Perfect, what's perfect? a black cat on a white cushion, a white cat on a black one, a soft brown woman in a flowery dress. There are a whole lot of ways to be perfect and not one of them is attained through punishment. Every culture has its ideal of human beauty and especially of female beauty. It's amazing how harsh some of these ideals are. An anthropologist told me that among the Inuit people he'd been with, if you could lay a ruler across a woman's cheekbones and it didn't touch her nose, she was a knockout. In this case, beauty is very high cheekbones and a very flat nose. The most horrible criterion of, beauty, m criterion of beauty I've yet met is the Chinese bound foot. Feet dwarfed and crippled to be three inches long increased a girl's attractiveness, therefore her money value. Now that's serious, no pain, no gain. But it's all serious. Ask anybody who ever worked eight hours a day, three inch heels. Or I think of when I was in high school in the 1940s. The white girls got their hair crinkled up by chemicals and heat so it would curl, and the black girls got their hair mashed flat by chemicals and heat so it wouldn't curl. Home perms hadn't been invented yet, and a lot of kids couldn't afford these expensive treatments, so they were wretched because they couldn't follow the rules, the rules of beauty. Beauty always has rules. It's a game. I resent the beauty game when I see it controlled by people who grab fortunes from it and don't care who they hurt. I hate it when I see it making people so self-dissatisfied that they starve and deform and poison themselves. Most of the time, I just play the game myself in a very small way. Buying a new lipstick, feeling happy about a pretty new silk shirt. It's not gonna make me beautiful, but it's beautiful itself, and I like wearing it. People have decorated themselves as long as they've been people. Flowers in the hair, tattoo lines on the face, coal on the eyelids, pretty silk shirts, things that make you feel good things that suit you, like a white pillow suits a lazy black cat. That's the fun part of the game. One rule of the game in most times and places is that it's the young who are beautiful. The beauty ideal is always a useful one, a youthful one. This is partly simple realism. The young are beautiful, the whole lot of them. The older I get, the more clearly I see it and enjoy it. But it gets harder and harder to enjoy facing the mirror. Who is that old lady? Where's her waist? I got resigned sort of to losing my dark hair and getting all this limp gray stuff instead. But now I'm gonna lose even that and end up with all pink scalp? I mean, enough already. 
Is that another mole or am I turning into an Appaloosa? How large can a knuckle get before it becomes a knee joint? I don't wanna see, I don't wanna know. And yet I look at men and women my age and older, their scalps and knuckles and spots and bulges through various and interesting, though various and interesting, don't affect what I think of them. Some of these people I consider to be very beautiful and others I don't. For old people, beauty doesn't come from the hormones the way it does for the young. It has to do with bones. It has to do with who the person is. More and more clearly, it has to do with what shines through those gnarly faces and bodies. I know what worries me most when I look in the mirror and see the old woman with no waist. It's not that I've lost my beauty. I never had enough to carry on about. It's that that woman doesn't look like me. She isn't who I thought I was. My mother told me once that walking down a street in San Francisco, she saw a blonde woman co coming towards her in a coat just like her. With a shock, she realized she was seeing herself in a mirrored window, but she wasn't a blonde, she was a redhead. Her hair had faded slowly and she'd always thought of herself, seeing herself as a redhead till she saw the change that made her for a moment, a stranger to herself. We're like dogs maybe. We don't really know where we begin and end. In space, yes, but in time, no. All little girls are supposed by the media anyhow to be impatient to reach puberty and to put on training bras before there's anything to train. But let me speak for the children who dread and are, who are humiliated by the changes adolescence brings to their body. I remember how I tried to feel good about the weird heavy feelings, the cramps, the hair where there hadn't been hair, the fat places that used to be thin places. They were supposed to be good because they all meant I was becoming a woman. And my mother tried to help me, but we were both shy and maybe both a little scared. Becoming a woman is a big deal and not always a good one. When I was 13 and 14, I felt like a whippet suddenly trapped inside a great lumpy St. Bernard. I wonder if boys don't often feel something like that as they get their growth. They're forever being told that they're supposed to be big and strong, but I think some of them miss being slight and lithe. A child's body is very easy to live in. An adult body isn't. The change is hard, and it's such a tremendous change that it's no wonder a lot of adolescents don't know who they are. They look in the mirror. That is me? Who's me? And then it happens again when you're 60 or 70. Cats and dogs are smarter than us. They look in the mirror once when they're a kitten or a puppy. They get all excited and run around hunting for the kitten or puppy behind the glass. And then they get it. It's a trick, a fake. They never look again. My cat will meet my eyes in the mirror, never his own. Who I am is certainly part of how I look and vice versa. I wanna know where I begin and end, what size I am um, and what suits me. People who say the body is unimportant floor me. How can they believe that? I don't wanna be a disembodied brain floating in a glass jar in a sci-fi movie. And I don't believe I'll ever be a disembodied spirit floating ethereally around. I'm not in this body, I am this body, waste or no waste. But it's all the same. But all the same, there's something about me that doesn't change, hasn't changed through all the remarkable, exciting, alarming, and disappointing transformations my body has gone through. There is a person there who isn't only what she looks like. And to find her and know her, I have to look through, look in, look deep, not only in space, but in time. I'm not lost until I lose my memory. There's the ideal beauty of youth and health, which never really changes and is always true. There's the ideal beauty of movie stars and advertising models, the beauty game ideal, which changes its rules all the time and from place to place and is never entirely true. And there's an ideal beauty that is harder to define or understand because it occurs not just in the body, but where the body and the spirit meet and define each other. And I don't know if it has any rules. One way I can try to describe that kind of beauty is to think of how we imagine people in heaven. I don't mean some literal heaven promised by a religion as an article of belief. I mean, just the dream, the yearning wish that we have that we can meet our beloved dead again. Imagine that the circle is unbroken, we meet them again on that beautiful shore. What did they look like? People have discussed this for a long time. I know one theory is that everybody in heaven is 33 years old. It includes people who die as babies. I guess they grow up in a hurry on the other side. And if they, if they die at 83, do they have to forget everything they learned for 50 years? Obviously, one can't get too literal with these imaginings. If you do, you run right up against that old, cold truth. You can't take it with you. 
But there is a real question there. How do we remember? How do we see a beloved person who is dead? My mother died at 83 of cancer, in pain, her spleen enlarged so that her body was misshapen. Is that the person I see when I think of her? Sometimes I wish it were not. It is a true image, yet it blurs, it clouds, a truer image. It is one memory among 50 years of memories of my mother. It is the last in time. Beneath it, behind it, is a deeper, complex, ever-changing image made from imagination, hearsay, photographs, memories. I see a little red-haired child in the mountains of Colorado, a sad-faced, delicate college girl, a kind, smiling young mother, a brilliantly intellectual woman, a peerless flirt, a, sense, a serious artist, a splendid cook. I see her rocking, weeding, writing, laughing. I see the turquoise bracelets on her delicate freckled arm. I see for a moment all that at once. I glimpse what no mirror can reflect, the spirit flashing out across the years. Beautiful. That must be what the great artists see and paint. That must be why the tired, aged faces in Rembrandt's portraits give us such delight. They show us beauty, not skin deep, but life deep. In Brian Lanker's album of photographs, I Dream a World, face after wrinkled face, tells us that getting old can be worth the trouble if it gives you time to do some soul making. Not all the dancing we do is dance with the body. The great dancers know that. And when they leap, our soul leaps with them. We fly, we're free. And the poets know that kind of dancing. Let Yeats say it. Oh, chestnut tree, great rooted blossomer, are you the leaf, the blossom, or the bowl? Oh, body swayed to music, oh, brightening glance, how can we know the dancer from the dance? So that was a really, that was a really nice, um, essay. I really love it. I love her thoughts on beauty and aesthetics, especially as a woman writing, um, especially a woman of her time, I feel like got such intense messaging from about, about what beauty is. Um, but Ursula K. Le Guin is not the kind of person to just accept the things that the world tells her that she must be or do. Um, she looks at it for herself and we are very much enriched for it. Um, thank you, Merely Mayhem. I agree, it was lovely. Um, yes, it is gonna be up uh, for watching later. Uh, all of my streams are uh, per perma streams. Um, so yes, uh, please, please watch again if, you, if you're so inclined. Um, what I, I love, what I love about this essay and her writing in general a lot is um, how she brings you in, brings you in with some like light humorous stuff before talking about some like pretty serious stuff, like how we see ourselves, how we interact with the world as bodies, as people who are our body. Um, that's heavy stuff, that's serious stuff. But she starts, she starts the essay talking about um, how dogs are ridiculous, how dogs have no idea what their bodies are like, how they get confused when a small dog attacks a big dog. They're just like, what's going on? Um, and then talking about cats and how cats just are so aware in, in such a different way. And that's, I think that's such a beautiful way of bringing us in. It's like, it also reminds us that we're not the only creatures on this planet. We are, we share this world with so many things, so many things that can also be aware of themselves in, in one way or another. Dogs are aware of themselves in a certain way and cats are certainly aware of, the, of their bodies in a certain way. Um, and it varies and it ranges. And like, I love that she also says that like, even among humans, it ranges, you know, like we don't, we don't all have like a, me a medium sense of our body. Like some people have a really strong sense of their bodies. Some people don't have a strong sense of their bodies at all. Um, which is, it's, it's just amazing. Um, this reminded me of a Tumblr post about how cats know their size, but dogs seem not to. I read it with 13. I remember thinking, wow, there's a lot to this. It totally, um, there totally is a lot to it. Um, the, um, the, the, it's such a cool, interesting thought and like way to, it's like, I love conceptualizing society through like dogs and cats. Like, I think it's, it can be really simplified, but if you, but, you know dogs and if you know cats it's like there's a lot of like 
things that they can teach us. There's a lot of like ways that we can understand ourselves better by, you know, comparing ourselves to dogs, comparing ourselves to cats. Um, that's an idea that I've come into recently um, of trying to sort of like learn and uh, instill in myself. It's an idea I got from uh, Braiding Sweetgrass by Wa Robin Wall um, which is an amazing book. Uh, but like the idea that plants and, and cats and dogs and all of these things, they're all people. They're, they're people who live in the world and they're people not beneath us, but who are living in the world with us. And if we, if we can treat them as people, um, and I guess I should clarify because not every human being treats other people as human beings, not every human being treats other people equally. Um, if we can treat them as equals, if we can accept that they know things that we don't, um, which is, I think, a hard pill to swallow for a lot of people who grew up uh, in the West. Um, a lot of white people have a hard time swallowing that, but it's true. Trees know things that we don't. Cats know things that we don't. Um, and it's really cool to, to be humble and, and try to learn, learn from the other creatures that inhabit this world with us. Um, so yeah, there, there is a lot of stuff to that. Um, uh, to that metaphor, I guess. Uh, duh, duh, duh. I think, yeah. Hmm. Wow. Well, okay. I'm merely mayhem. I'm so glad to hear you say that. I'm glad that you like came across this uh, thing. Just again, like just so you know, just to repeat what I. That the title of the essay, it's called Dogs, Cats, and Dancers, Thoughts About Beauty. Um, you could probably find it um, online in PDF, PDF form. This book is called Wave in the Mind. Um, if, you, if you want to, to read it for yourself again, um, but this video will stay up. I'll put timestamps in this video after it's done so people can skip to just the various essays that we read if you want to. There wasn't a lot of discussion today. The, these, it's not that these don't merit discussion, but it's like, it. A lot of the a lot of these works are relatively clear, um, and maybe it's maybe it's something that we could would be easier to discuss after after internalizing it for a while. Um, yeah, I'm just sort of thinking out loud at this point. Um, I think though, uh, yeah, I'm really happy that I I read some of this book. There's a couple more essays. Maybe I'll do another another stream just to finish up this book and then like tie the two videos together or whatever. Um, but I'm really happy with this. Ursula K. Le Guin is one of my favorite authors. She's so insightful. If you've only read her fiction works, I hope that this video, that these essays will like convince you to like look at her nonfiction stuff because, oh my gosh, there is a huge wealth of, of, of thought and, and knowledge and, and, and consideration. Um, that's one, one of my favorite things about her and her writing is she is so thoughtful. She is so aware and so present and so thoughtful in her writing and, 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 and she conveys it with, with humor and love. Um, so there's, there's nothing better than that. Um, but with that, I guess I will, um, close out this stream. Um, thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. I hope, I hope you had as much fun as I did. Um, and I will see you next week. I'll be back next week. All right. Take care. Read a book, you nerds. Bye. Thanks again. Bye.